Hi, my name is Brian Chung and I'm an economics reporter with Yahoo Finance. I'm excited to host a conversation today here at the International Monetary Fund, taking a deeper dive into the world economic outlook, which the fund uh, just published. And we'll be chatting specifically about chapter three, which discusses research and the policy implications in funding research as it relates to economic growth. And the title of that chapter is Research and Innovation, Fighting the Pandemic and Boosting long-term growth. And joining me now for this discussion is an economist in the research department over at the IMF and also a co-leader for this chapter. That's Philip Barrett. Hi, Philip. Hi, Brian. How are you? I'm good. So let's dive right into it. Uh, the big summary of this chapter is kind of talking about research funding, right, and its potential impact on productivity, economic potential. So I guess just to start off at an extremely high level, Walk us through the findings of your work in the chapter here and describe to us in more detail uh, what the relationship might be between uh, research and the economy. That's right, Brian. So what we've seen over the last sort of four or five decades is a long, slow decline in uh, productivity, which is an essential ingredient into economic growth. And that's not only concerning, it's a little bit perplexing and it's perplexing because as that's happened, at the same time, we've seen an increase in spending on research and development. And that's a bit puzzling because we would normally think of research and development spending as driving productivity growth. And the angle that the chapter takes on this is to ask if perhaps it's not the amount of research and development spending that's necessarily the issue here, but perhaps instead the composition. One of the things that we've seen over that, that time period is that research spending has become increasingly private and applied and less public and basic. And the important distinction between applied and basic research here is that applied research is about sort of taking products to market, that final step of the innovation chain. Whereas basic research is typically more undirected in sort of universities or research labs and doesn't necessarily have a specific end in mind. Uh, if you want an example here, an example of like applied research is the patents for the mRNA uh, uh, vaccines we've just seen for COVID. And the basic research that underpins that is decades of work uh, on, on human genetics. There's three main findings in our report. Um, the first is that basic research uh, tends to have a widespread and long lasting uh, impact and is cited uh, more broadly internationally and over longer periods of time than similar applied research. Secondly, the, that basic research does have an impact on productivity growth, not just domestically, but where it really shines is in terms of the international effects, where it spills over to other countries, particularly sort of middle and low income countries. The third key finding in the report is that the engines of uh, uh, sort of new technologies, the advanced economies, are perhaps, if anything, spending just a not quite enough uh, on, on research and on, particularly on basic research spending. We estimate that if they were to roughly double private research subsidies and increase public spending by around a third, that would add about 0.2% to growth permanently, something that really adds up over the long run. So this is really interesting, and there's so many other places that we can go. But I think first I want to go into just the, the spillover implications of all of this, because it's not autarky, right? It's not just in a closed economy. If you increase research, that's going to help that economy. I mean, this is a global economy where there's a lot of interconnectedness. So explain to us how uh, development of research in one country can spill over, not just to those that are geographically closer, um, but to around the world as well. And then also explain to us maybe the dynamic, especially if that neighboring country is an emerging market country, what the uh, stakes are for them to have a global community of research. So we do find that there is, as you say, this, this degree of international spillover. And there is an element here of, of home bias, which is that uh, countries that that do innovation do disproportionately cite their own country's research and that's that's kind of natural you'd imagine the sorts of industries that are in countries tend to be correlated with the type of research uh, particularly like that basic scientific research um, that's that's done but what's notable is that degree of home bias is much less um, for uh, uh, for for basic research than applied uh, and moreover it's particularly true that international research is important for emerging uh, and developing economies. There you see that uh, foreign research is particularly important uh, in driving innovation for those countries, which is not super surprising given that a lot of it does happen uh, in advanced economies.
So let's talk about policy implications because the, the, the difference is that you outlined between, let's say, for example, applied and basic research does kind of also funnel into the public versus private side of things, right? R&D at a company that's uh, private is going to be a bit different than uh, for public policy, right? Where the government might be putting money into a certain uh, nationwide program, for example. So what are the policy implications that are really honestly the conclusion, the big takeaway from uh, this chapter for policymakers around the world who might be reading this and thinking, what should the optimal policy be when it comes to uh, spend? So you make an important point, Brian, which is that there is obviously a correlation between public and private versus basic and applied, and, and private companies are more likely to do applied research because of that profit motive, because they want to uh, uh, get products to market. But that's not to say that they have no incentive to do basic research. That's particularly true uh, of larger companies which are able to internalize the gains from doing that basic research. If you're a small company, often the uh, benefits of the most basic and fundamental forms of research are so widespread that it's very hard for you to capture them, so there's not so much of an incentive um, to do that. And that's something that's baked into our analysis in, in terms of the economic modeling we do. That's an important mechanism. And the conclusion that that comes to uh, when we do the optimal policy analysis is that both public and private funding of basic research uh, are important. There is, however, a challenge when you're trying to fund private basic research because it can be quite hard to distinguish uh, between what's basic and, and what's applied. And one of the other uh, conclusions we have in the report uh, is to show that if you can't make that distinction between things, um, first of all, it doesn't completely undermine the motive uh, for still trying to subsidize private research. And secondly, that closer connections between the public and private sectors uh, might be a partial substitute for that inability to distinguish between applied and basic research. Is there any sort of, I guess, mechanism by which you feel that would be uh, most well structured? For example, a lot of uh, private research that might get public help would look like the form of a grant, right? Um, does the research or anything that you looked at kind of come to conclusions about what might be the best way to structure that type of policy support from the government, knowing uh, the potential benefits that could come from both public and private uh, work in this space? We don't look at specific uh, funding mechanisms for different types of research, but we do look at this division between uh, public and private. We also have a, a case study um, on mRNA COVID vaccines, where it's very clear there that many decades of um, basic research, often publicly funded, uh, has contributed to you know, the enormous, not only humanitarian success of those vaccines, but the incredible economic benefit uh, they've had as well. So let's zone in on one specific political story that we know we've been following for the last few years, and that's the interaction between the two largest economies, right, the United States and China. And we know that the fight between the two as it regards to uh, intellectual property has oftentimes also brought into the limelight the role of research and protectionism when it comes to certain types of research within borders. Um, now, this research also that you've done has theorized what would be the global impact of a decoupling of basic scientific research between the two. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's right. As you say, people have previously looked at different forms of decoupling in trade or, or, or other factors of production. And the different angle we have on that particular question here is to look at something like a scientific decoupling. What would happen if China and the US were uh, unable or at least reduce their ability to uh, interact on that scientific basis. So you can think of that as things like it being much harder for researchers to visit each other's countries, to meet at conferences, and have those important interpersonal uh, reaction, I interactions uh, that are so important in developing new ideas. And what we find is that uh, sort of a complete breakdown of that relationship would have at least first round effects uh, close to around 1% of, of global productivity, which is a fairly sizable impact. Moreover, in practice, there would undoubtedly be large second round effects, which uh, we aren't able to measure, at least in this study, uh, through impacts on third countries as well. <laughs> All right, well, we'll have to see if there's follow up on that. Now, uh, I just want to ask about methodology, and hopefully we don't lose anyone in the weeds of this, but this is really interesting. How did you go about this type of thing? Because you know, you're not when you're looking at research, it's not an easily definable, quantifiable variable that you can just go to some data set to grab. Uh, 
So were you counting citations? Are you looking at patents? How, what type of uh, look from a numbers wise standpoint did you use to kind of arrive at the conclusions that you arrived at? Yeah, so I'm, I'm delighted to get into the weeds, uh, and I hope you don't lose too many people. Um, but, but we have sort of two main approaches in, in, in the chapter. The first one is empirical, and there we're using um, what I think is really cool new data, uh, which allows us to link, as you suggest, uh, patents, which we can think of as being like the smallest unit of economic innovation, uh, not just to other patents, which people have done in the past, but now we can link them to individual scientific research papers that are cited by those patents. And that's the thing that allows us to trace through at a very miniature level exactly what the impact of scientific research is on innovation there. Uh, and that's particularly useful, as I said, uh, as I referred to earlier in that case study on the mRNA vaccines. There we're able to show that there were successive waves of innovation, first in the late 80s, early 90s, around, uh, hu around um, reading genetic codes. Um, then secondly, in the early 2000s, about editing them, and then now later ones in the last few years about understanding how to manipulate uh, those genetic codes to affect cell function. And those are exactly the things that the mRNA vaccines exploit. And with this data, we can not only count the, 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 the patents, but also the scientific references, and look at those individual papers and categorize and classify them and try and understand how that builds through to you know, an enormous you know, economic innovation like mRNA vaccines. Um, the second thing we also do is we have uh, an economic model as well that helps us uh, try to put that mechanism inside a larger macroeconomic context. And that's where some of the policy conclusions come from. There, that trades off different incentives that private firms might have regarding incentives to do research versus their own size uh, in particular. Well, for the viewers then that stuck around through that, let's go even deeper. Let's talk about the econometrics of all of this, because what was interesting to me was that it's kind of looking at specifically productivity, which has been a puzzle that economists around the world have been trying to look at because productivity has uh, been a major contributor to this low interest rate world that we have. And again, we're not trying to go over to our star here. We're not even trying to figure out exactly what variable we're looking at when it comes to total factor productivity. But tell us about how you kind of arrived at, hey, this is gonna be the contribution to why, to total output based off of uh, research, changes in research. Um, how did you ultimately try to quantify that? What were the challenges in doing so? Yeah, so the I think the important step is to use this new data to be able to build measures of uh, country-specific research stocks that are available. So that might sound a little bit technical, but the idea here is to use country-specific characteristics to try and understand uh, how much access, essentially, countries have, particularly to foreign uh, basic knowledge given that's so important in the production, uh, in the innovation process. And that for me is, was the important step uh, that we took here. Uh, and a lot of the early work we did was in building uh, country specific stocks of foreign knowledge by figuring out what was most relevant to those countries uh, through a variety of sort of econometric regressions. So uh, lastly here, I wanna ask about um, COVID, and, and you mentioned that the mRNA vaccines are uh, you know, a great example of all of this working in practice. Was there anything about COVID, because we know that this has affected everyone around the world uh, quite impactfully, that kind of emphasizes certain aspects of these findings and the importance and the relevance of research as it relates not just to growth prospects from a GDP standpoint, but from a humanity standpoint? Yes, uh, and I mean, from a, from a personal perspective, the, the thing that inspired me to want to work on, on this topic was exactly this example, the development of, of those vaccines in quite astonishing time, uh, without which like, we would be still, I'm, I imagine, sitting around waiting uh, for vaccines to be developed. Uh, that was really quite remarkable and has had uh, just an astonishing uh, impact on economies worldwide. And then lastly, I guess, actually bonus question here, any plans on following up to this research? Are there other avenues that as you were constructing this chapter, you said that could be plentiful to explore in the future? 
That's a great question. So one of the things we did look at in the report was uh, the interaction of basic scientific research with new technologies to address climate change. Obviously, climate change is a massive threat uh, to the global economy. And one of the things we will almost certainly have to do to address it is to develop new technologies that allow us to continue to consume large amounts of energy, but at much, much lower uh, carbon emissions. And one of the things that we did analyze in the chapter is the extent to which clean versus dirty technologies depend more or less on basic scientific innovation versus more applied things. And we found that essentially the scientific content of clean innovation tends to be higher than of dirty innovation. Uh, and that's the finding we have in the chapter at the moment. I think there's still a bit more work to be done there to understand exactly what that means and exactly what the role of basic scientific research is in addressing climate change. Well, certainly when there is more research on that front, we'll definitely have a follow-up conversation there. Uh, but again, the title of this chapter, Research and Innovations Fighting the Pandemic and Boosting Long-Term Growth with Philip Barrett, economist in the research department of the IMF and co-leader for the chapter. Thanks again for sitting down with me today. A fascinating discussion for sure. Thank you, Brian.